me, there we go, <laughs> in bringing that library to life. Um, it was a group of women who apparently like cats, <laughs> who envisioned the library in Dwight. This is the story of their vision of a Dwight Public Library and how they engaged the community in helping them make that vision a reality. On January 26, 1914, in the home of Mrs. Frank L. Smith, 25 members of the Ladies Literary Circle, a Dwight Women's Group since 1897, met to discuss a new women's organization in the village. They voted to join the Illinois Federation of Women's Club under the name Dwight Women's Club. And when they received federated and state recognition on February 2nd, 1914, 110 years ago, they elected officers and the first club year began. For a while, many of the ladies continued membership in both organizations. However, in 1918, after 22 years in the community, the Ladies Literary Circle disbanded in favor of membership in the Dwight Women's Club. The motto of the Dwight Women's Club was then, and is today, where there is no vision, the people perish. This story of our library is all about their vision. A public library fund was established in late 1919 when Ms. Gertrude Harris and a few other club members each put a gift sum into an account at a local bank. It would appear from the club minutes that a few months later in 1920, the first community contribution to the public library fund was made by Walter J. Hilby, a piano teacher in Dwight, Allison. <laughs> He proposed giving half the receipts of a recital to the Women's Club if they would place it in a library fund. He donated $78.50. About six months later, at the opening day meeting of the Dwight Women's Club in October 1920, with attendance in the neighborhood of 100 members and guests, the newspaper reported, you're too slow, you're ahead of me, Mary, go back. Oh. There you go. The newspaper reported that Ms. Gertrude Harris, who was now president of the club, had an interest in every phase of activity in which the club would see fit to engage, but that her primary interest was as much progress as it is possible to make towards the establishment of a public library, which latter object has been the vision of the club since its organization. At that meeting, the club established an official library committee and a library fund committee. The ladies took Ms. Harris's comments to heart, and in the next year and a half, the library fund grew. At the Livingston County, at the Livingston Theater in 1921, the Women's Club performed Edna Ferber's three-act comedy, $1,200 a year. <laughs> the tickets sold out early, and the net proceeds were $302.77. For you Dwight history buffs, Kim Drexel and I wondered, so where was this Livingston Theater? And he did a little looking, and he found this article, but he couldn't find a picture. But it was at the site of the second Seymour Drugstore. So if you're from Dwight, you think it was on Avenue, the original um, Seymour Drugstore where chemist John Alton was working on the Keeley Cure. And then Seymour's moved to Franklin Street, where the Livingston Theater was built, as Seymour Drugs had then moved to East Main Street. Most of us would recognize the location of the Livingston Theater as that of the old American Legion. Oh, okay. The article says further down that the theater design copied that of the Princess Theater in Joliet, which was built in 1913. Um, that was on Chicago Street, down from the Rialto. I used to go there as a child. If you look at this picture of the Princess Theater, and if that's a little bit of what the Livingston Theater looks like, then I think it's interesting that you see a couple architectural features that resemble the first library. A little bit of those arches and a little bit of the doors. But I digress. Professor Hildy was continuing to donate profits from his recitals. Library committee members were making donations, individuals from the community were making donations, and in March 1922, Major Curtis Judd, who was a Dwight businessman, he was an investor and a partner in the Keeley Institute, 
made a donation of $25. That brought his total donations to $125. And with his contribution, the library fund reached $1,000. How about that? The ladies of the club said we're going to invest that $1,000 because we are savvy when it comes to money. Soon after, the Women's Club established a library building committee because they believed in their vision, and with the $1,000, they decided it was starting to take shape. So the question is, how much money did they need to raise to build a public library? The minutes and the records aren't abundantly clear, but it appears that their first fundraising goal was about $5,000. Then people noticed that they needed a little more, and it rose to $7,000. Then there were newspaper accounts that said they were trying to raise $9,000. But in actuality, the reported costs of the lot, the construction, and the furnishings came close to $12,000, which, adjusted for inflation today, that would be about $213,000. So that was a lot of money to raise then. That would be a lot of money for the Women's Club to raise now in order to make the vision of a library a reality. So it's now mid-1922. The club started fundraising in 1920. And now community organizations were starting to join with the Women's Club in their efforts during the next year and a half. At the Blackstone Theater, um, the Women's Club put on another play. And they put on, it was called The Man on the Box, and they raised $180. There was a group called the Eastern Star in Livington Lodge. They came up with $133.19. The Royal Neighbors wrote a check for $25. The World War Fund wrote a check for $67. Two groups from the Catholic Church made donations that year. 20% of their April event receipts from the Knights of Columbus and the proceeds from a party in the summer from the Catholic Ladies Aid Society. The Tuesday Night Literary Society gave money. Professor Hildy, our friend, was still giving money from his recitals. The Chicago and Alton Railroad had an employee concert. They donated $125. And 1,000 chances were sold at O'Malley's Drugstore for an original oil painting donated by Dr. Lark. None of us are sure who Dr. Lark was, but thank you for your donation. <laughs> um, and what about the Women's Club members? Well, they held what the newspaper called one of the most successful parties ever given at the Idle Hour Park. They had 54 card tables playing bridge, it's white, playing 500, playing euchre, it's white, and the money was donated for what would have been 10 more tables. The owner made a cash donation, and Mrs. Electra Connor donated her piano services. The library fund grew by $150, and the idle hour, um, which I heard of often over the years, was located a little east of where Jensen's gas station is now. Um, so you north, kind of see north and east. Out on the edge of town, mm -hmm. the east end. So, after three years of real effort and successful parties, Fundraising was way slower than the ladies were hoping for, <laughs> and way less than what they needed. So, despite their past support, the Women's Club decided to reach out again, asking 20 local organizations to do something more to raise money for the library. They contacted 20 organizations Sadly, the club minutes reflect only 10 responded. The Women's Club members had to admit that continuous fundraising, even for an important cause, is difficult. At the October 10, 1923 Board of Managers meeting, the Library Committee made a report, and I will share it with you. Several years ago, a plan was inaugurated to secure a public library in Dwight. At the present time, there is on hand $1,830 raised for that purpose. There has been some complaint <laughs> about continuing to collect money for that purpose, and for that reason, and for the further reason that it would take a long time to raise the amount necessary to establish a library in a credible manner, it has been suggested that the following plan be adopted a library be established in the high school building and the funds on hand be used to equip it. It had to be a really difficult recommendation 
for those members of the Women's Club. The ladies proposed that there be a special Women's Club committee to purchase books and equipment with the money they already raised, that they would want the library to be open to the public under reasonable regulations, that all the books would be cataloged, and if a public library were ever established, everything could move to that building, and that the library would be maintained by the school board with no cost to the Women's Club. The board also went on record as saying nothing would interfere with the library project being taken up at a later date, and that fundraising could and should continue to support a library wherever it was housed. After a general discussion, the board moved and seconded that the proposition be presented to the Women's Club members, and it favorably received, taken before the school board. Motion carried. The members of the club accepted the proposition at their next meeting on October 23rd. The women's vision of a public library had changed a lot. A week later, on October 30th, 1923, Colonel Frank L. Smith, husband of Mrs. Frank Smith, who was also a library committee co-chair, spoke to the club about the desirability, almost necessity, of having a public library in Dwight. He pledged $1,000. The October 23rd proposition immediately rescinded. <laughs> the ladies of the club said, we've got $2,830 in the fund. We are more determined than ever to make this happen. Dollar by dollar, more funds were raised. The Odd Fellows Hall on East Main became the site of many library benefit suppers, and you all know where that is today. As Mary showed you. Oh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> The Women's Club earned $125 from a fried chicken supper there where Mr. Ollendorf donated the cost of the rolls. They probably weren't cinnamon rolls, but I'm sure they were good. <laughs> At another Women's Club supper there, they raised another $132. Mr. Ollendorf again donated the cost of the rolls. He donated a lot of rolls to the library cause. And for this dinner, the Ladies' Social Union of the Methodist Church loaned the silverware. Thank you very much. I think he's done there, that, so. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, another card table party for $50. The Women's Club had a thrift sale. They picked up $45. There was a card party and dance at the Mazan Hall. They made a whopping $44, and the newspaper report said they were really excited about that. And the Mazan Hall would be located where the Palms Apartments are hmm. today. There were more donations from local citizens, and then an elaborate club calendar was spearheaded by Mrs. Smith. Women's club members and their family and friends and community members signed up on a calendar to make a pledge of five cents. Mrs. Smith pledged one nickel a day for the year. Club members pledged a nickel a day for the designated month. Community members or club members pledged a nickel a day for a week, and some people just pledged a nickel for one day during the year on the calendar. When your day or week or month came up on the club calendar, your donation was due. And don't think that the Women's Club wouldn't remember because every name was listed <laughs> in the Women's Club book, and I'm sure they marked them off. If you are interested in your own organizations trying something like that, um, you should talk to Gloria because she understands it way better than me. But <coughs> the fact is the club and calendar actually raised a total of $971.64. Now that's one penny short of a nickel on the end, so I don't know who was short, <laughs> but um, that would be 19,400 plus nickels. Every nickel mattered, every nickel helped, it was a great success. In April of 1925, about another year and a half later, that's four and a half years of dedicated fundraising, the Women's Club Building Committee recommended a site for the library building, just south of the original Methodist Church. The club voted to purchase the lot at 108 South Perry Avenue for a public library, at the cost of $1,000. Now at this point, maybe some of you are wondering, what about that Dwight Woman's Club cookbook? Wasn't that, didn't that raise money for the library? And the answer is yes. 
In fact, the idea for the cookbook came about the same month that they bought the lot. The club ladies, like Mrs. McWilliams, collected and compiled recipes from members and community members, and the cookbook was created and sold to benefit the library fund. 1,000 copies were ordered at the cost of $409.50. And Mrs. Ahern reported in April 1927 that $999 had been made in cookbook sales and they were all sold. Wow. Does anybody here have one? I do. <laughs> okay. And the library does, and they're over on the table, so you can take a look. The Dwight Women's Club approved and awarded the contract to build the library to Sondergaard Brothers at a cost estimate of $10,000 about five months after purchasing the lot. The architect was R.G. Home at Joliet. The floor plan, which you can see here as well as over there, included a club room with the plan that the women's club and other organizations could and did rent that for meetings after the library was built. As an aside, in later years, the women's club purchased a piano, which they kept in the club room. They charged other organizations 50 cents to use it if they wanted to use it during their meetings. <laughs> Some groups thought that was a little high. And so the women's club said, okay, we'll give you a special price if you need 10 meetings or more. Such a deal. On the day the contract was awarded, the Star and Herald addressed the role of the women's club, whoops, you're ahead of me, with the library project goes back. Enough cannot be said in commendation of the Dwight Women's Club, who has sponsored the movement for a public library for many years. It is true, lodges, other organizations and clubs, not to mention private individuals, have aided the club financially in their efforts, but to Dwight Women's Club must be awarded the everlasting credit of keeping the project in the minds of our people and promoting, encouraging, and fathering the sentiment for a library besides raising funds for it. Fundraising efforts have been numerous and community-centered. Every card party, dance, play, supper, as well as the club calendar have been an opportunity to engage as a community to build something important, a library for the village. But it would have taken years more of those fundraisers at the rate they were raising money to pay for the library, the books, and the furnishings, were it not for some successful Dwight businessmen who supported the vision of a public library. In October 1926, the, Dwight, the Star and Herald published a list of those who had made notable pledges or donations, at least four of which were $1,000, which would be about $17,000 today. And I'm sure you'll recognize some of the names. The Colonel and Mrs. Frank L. Smith. There she is, I'm ready. Mr. and Mrs. James Alton. Edward McWilliams. Major Curtis Judd. Mr. Charles McWilliams Sr., and that's him with his youngest son, James Alexander, who's the father of our Alex, and C. M. Baker. It had taken a little over six years of fundraising work. The Women's Club had purchased a lot, they'd awarded a contract, a library was being built, they were starting to collect books, they had to be pretty excited. On the rainy afternoon of Tuesday, October 12, 1926, the Dwight Library was dedicated at a ceremony at the Blackstone Theater. Speeches were made, people were thanked, organizations were thanked, music was played, songs were sung, there was a big Brooklyn pageant where kids in the town all dressed up as their favorite characters. Mrs. Dondonville, the White Women's Club president, spoke. The club alone could not have accomplished what they did had not we had the cooperation and wholehearted support of public-spirited citizens. And Mr. George Utley was a well-known librarian. I love that. He was a well-known librarian. His comments give us a little perspective on the times. Schools are now everywhere. And the time is not distant when every town will have a library like you are to have. The pleasure in getting books from a library is because we want to read them, not because we have to. There was a library in Dwight. The women had made their vision a reality, almost. They still needed $1,800 to finish paying for it. It would not belong to the village until it was paid for, free and clear, 
and until the citizens of the village of Dwight voted and approved the actual establishment of a public library. The newly dedicated library belonged to the Dwight Women's Club, debt and all. <laughs> a special election was held the Thursday after the dedication for the purpose of voting on the proposition of the establishment and maintenance of a free public library within the village of Dwight. 507 votes were cast. 246 were in favor. 242 <coughs> were against, and one scratched. <laughs> the proposition passed by the smallest of margins, 22 votes. An editorial in the paper expressed great dismay at that vote and said, some citizens must have been worried that the tax would just keep going up every year. Imagine. <laughs> Some thought they had to stay at the library to use the books and magazines. They didn't understand it would be a circulating library. And probably some people just didn't understand the question. But by 22 votes, it did pass. A library board of trustees was established, and that assessment tax was levied to support the library. With the passing vote, the remaining $1,800 debt on the library was a large and very immediate problem for the Dwight Women's Club. The village couldn't accept the library or give it to the new board of library managers until it was free of debt. A month later, in November 20, 1926, Mrs. Donovanville, the Women's Club president, explained that a loan had been made at the bank to finish paying for the library so the building could be turned over to the, lot, to the village. In fact, five members of the Dwight Women's Club agreed to sign as security on a note with the bank to acquire the money needed to relieve the library building of all indebtedness. And a month later, on December 1926, the deed was signed, the property was conveyed to the directors of the library in the village, the sum of one dollar was received from the village board for the library to the Women's Club and they immediately placed it in the library <laughs> fund. On January 31st, 1927, the Dwight Public Library opened to the people of Dwight, and the editor of the Star and Herald spoke to the village. Well, we have our library, people. Now let's use and enjoy it. The day the library opened, they had 1,679 books, 1,400 of which had been donated. On February 3rd, 200 had been checked out in the first three days of operation. After one month, 802 had been issued to patrons, and the librarian, Miss Martin, decided because so many kids were using books or coming to take them, that she would start the KBC Club, Keep Books Clean. <laughs> started at the library for local children to help them remember to have clean hands when they handled books. On March 31st, 1927, the first two months of the library, over 2,000 books had been checked out. And one year later, 2,257 books are now in the collection. 8,700 books and 285 magazines had been loaned. This was an average of eight books or magazines for every hour the library had been opened during the first year. During that year, 645 adults and children had registered as borrowers. Today, our library has a collection that goes far beyond books, and it is reported to Kim, from Kim to me, that we have a collection of 40,416 items and 1,789 patrons. Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Donovanville have coordinated the donation of books from the community the Congregational Church donated their entire library of over 150 volumes. I don't know what they were, but thank you. A magazine subscription to Good Housekeeping was started in February 1928. I'm just going to stop. Can you see that it says a disease that leads to divorce? <laughs> Interesting magazine title. Nonetheless, that um, magazine continues to be an active subscription here at Prairie Creek Public Library. And apparently to address our spiritual and moral needs of the community, 
The Christian Science Church donated the Christian Science Monitor. The German Lutheran Church donated the Walter Lee Messenger. And Mrs. Frank L. Smith made sure we had the Catholic magazine. Of the books that were donated from 1926 to 29, some are still on the shelf at the Dwight Public Library, and Lisa pulled them for us over there, and they are all first editions. Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Price, So Big by Edna Ferber, which later won a Pulitzer Prize, The Professor's House by Moore Cather, The Bridge of San Louis Ray by Thornton Wilder, The Age of Innocence by Ethan Morton, and Dodsworth by Sinclair Lewis. When I was kind of looking through some of the books, go back, the Dodsworth book was apparently one of the most frequently checked out of the library, and it must have been amazing, so we still have it if anybody wants to read it. <laughs> I was thinking about checking it out myself. We also have in the library a book entitled Recollections of John McWilliams Go ahead. as dictated by self. No. <laughs> published by the Princeton University Press. Um, it was considered a great gift to the library, and um, John Sr., who is pictured here, was the brother of David McWilliams, who started the Bank of Dwight. And John Sr., pictured here, started the Bank of Odell. And his son, John Jr., just for a fun fact, was the father of Julia Child. Mm -hmm. And lots of you may know that, but just in case. So donations to the first library consisted of more than dollars in books. Perhaps you've noticed some of these pieces that the club minutes suggest were early donations to the library. The Tuesday Night Literary Society donated a table for the reading room. The Junior Women's Club donated a small fiesta table, and we think this might be it. Mrs. Reynolds and Mrs. Ziegler from the Women's Club donated some Mexican figurines. The Dwight Women's Club gave a provincial table, which is located on the first floor, but the chairs seem to be gone. The Women's Club, it appears, also donated the table and chairs with the floral motif that we see over in the children's section. And many people in the community have pointed out to me that they remember those from the library on South Prairie. At first, we thought this floor lamp may have been original donation. It's starting to look like it's more likely that it was found during the renovation of the carriage house here which also makes it a piece of library history, but we're checking into that. There are many other donations listed in the Women's Club records, Mexican chairs, Peruvian lamps, a red reading chair, and at the original library, the fireplace fittings and <coughs> lamps were donated by a Mr. Thomas Ugarty of Pontiac. They were made by four inmates at the State Reformatory in Pontiac. The citizens of Dwight we're using the library every day. The ladies of the club were still fundraising to pay off that $1,800 debt. More calendars, more card parties, more thrift sales, more lunches, more suppers, more bake sales. $75 here, $150.40 there, all with one goal in mind. And then the minutes from December 1927, the end of the year that the library opened a little more than seven years from when the first dollars went into the public library fund. The White Women's Club met in the library club room on a Tuesday afternoon for the last meeting of their club year. Mrs. Dondonville, who presided, announced the entire debt of the library had been paid. The White Women's Club members had to be saying, we did it. <laughs> a long time ago, in the village of Dwight, there was a group of women who belonged to the Dwight Women's Club, and they had a vision. And in that village, there were community members from all walks of life who shared the vision of those Dwight Women's Club members. And working together, that vision became a reality, a public library in Dwight. I need to thank people, and here's my list. Is it one more? I'm sorry. Sorry. That's okay. Okay. Is this stuff?